Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Regenerative Health Podcast. I'm Dr. Max Colhain. Now, I am very excited to be delivering you this interview with South African nature photographer, author, and conservationist Ed Schroeder. Before we launch in, I would like to give you a little bit of context uh, for this interview. And the question that I am anticipating is that why is a GP doctor with an interest in health optimization talking about an obscure tribal African cattle breed? Um, what does this have to do with preventing and reversing human diseases? Well, let, let me talk you through uh, my logic and maybe by the end of the interview, uh, you'll see exactly where I'm going with this. So how I see it is that um, we need ruminant uh, meat as uh, to thrive as humans. And there's extensive evidence to suggest that humans have always eaten a large amount of uh, of animal and ruminant meat and if you if we look at ancestral evidence um, anthropological evidence and stable isotope evidence um, all all of our, all these point to us using um, ruminant herbivores whether it's bison whether it's uh, whether it's uh, woolly mammoths whether it's um, ancestral cattle uh, or megafauna as a food source so I, I think it goes without saying that we need red meat um, and that is essentially what what is going to be allowing us to thrive um, optimally the, the next point is that this meat ideally should be as close as possible to wild and the characteristics of of why that's important is because it's going to have the highest nutrient profile when that animal is eaten its natural wild diet and for ruminants this means grass so we're going to have not only the most healthy meat but also that that animal is going to be most respecting its welfare and if we're putting say cows inside in a feedlot eating grain and indoors that that's neither their optimal diet nor respecting that cow's natural instincts or natural needs um, as to be outdoors and to be grazing freely so we, we want as close to possible um, as wild for for our meat and that's why meats like uh, wild uh, venison and, and wild bison are so healthy um, and they do contain a, a very very favorable omega-3 to 6 ratio and and a whole bunch of very very important and nutritious micro micronutrients so so the next step in this reasoning is that beef is the most accessible um, meat and currently in australia in the us or all over the world we have a, a very large capability to grow large amounts of of beef so beef cattle um it, it's it's perfect for human food and it's what we have uh, at the moment we also need to regenerate the soil and do the process of the past particularly five decades with the advent of more and more invasive and what i like to call degenerative agricultural processes the the soil nutrients and the, the microflora the soil uh, moisture is all being slowly de depleted by this process of extractive and degenerative um, agriculture but it, it doesn't really it doesn't have to be that way and if we use regenerative grazing techniques we can also regenerate um, the land so we can use these ruminant herbivores to help us preserve and extend the ability of of ourselves to f to feed ourselves so and um, what that leads to then, um, and this is why I've um, had the pleasure of talking to Ed, is that I believe the Nguni cattle are some of the best uh, tools for, for this job. And the reasons that we'll explore, explore in the interview is that the, uh, the traits that they have evolved um, mean that they are extremely hardy, they're extremely adapted, and, and they can um, do this job of land regeneration at the same time as providing us with very, very nutrient-dense food. Because of these characteristics, they're also not needed to they don't need drenches and other forms of chemical human intervention because of their natural abilities to be resistant to ticks and a whole bunch of, of diseases. And their weight as well and their hoof size is, again, optimal for regenerative pasture. So I think they're really, for those reasons, that's why I'm so passionate about them. And if you're interested in them, perhaps you want some more context, check out my episodes with farmers Brian Usher, Jake Welke, um, and Edwin Rouse. 
um, and that will again bring you up to speed with a, a bit more about about these creatures if you're enjoying this content um please subscribe on the podcast platforms um and share share it out but uh on, on to the podcast now i hope you enjoy it please let me know what you think um and i think this was a very very interesting conversation so thank you very much Okay, Ed, thank you so much for coming on to the Regenerative Health Podcast. Thanks, Max. Thanks for having me. All right, well, let's start this conversation with the Nguni. What are the Nguni cattle? Uh, the Nguni is, are, are the tribes that came down from Central Africa to Southern Africa. They were called the Nguni tribes. And, of course, the cattle were named after them. But you can have various Nguni cattle. You can have that they were all Sangha cattle. The indigenous cattle of, of Africa were called Sangha. So you get the Sangha Nguni, the Sangha Pedi, the Sangha Venda, the Sangha Avamba, various Sangha, various Sangha cattle. They're all indigenous. But the ones that came to the East Coast um, were called Nguni. And they were really the cattle of the Zulu people on the east coast of Southern Africa. Yeah. And, and maybe tell us a little bit about how these cattle uh, ended up in, in Southern Eastern Africa. What was the journey that they um, made in order to get to where they are now? It's a long, arduous journey that they went through um, coming from – Ethiopia in that region, um, they came down through a set of fly free corridor. In other words, it, it was very harsh territory. And uh, through the forested areas, they couldn't go because of the tsetse fly. And then they came through the tsetse fly free corridors um, all the way down through to the west coast of Africa, where we have the Ovambo, and the east coast of South Africa, where we have the Nguni. So they've come down a long journey with incredible hardships, and hence they are so well adapted. Through natural selection, they are actually the cattle that have survived. And so they are very hardy, but I think we'll get onto that a little later. Definitely, uh, and that is something that I really want to ex expand upon. But but for the listener, uh, the the point that's really important is that this is a cow that has had an incredible natural selection pressure, and Mother Nature, in the form of disease, pests, ticks, predators, has shaped the genetics um, and and the blueprint of of this animal in a way that um, other cattle breeds uh, haven't. Uh, oh, it hasn't happened so recently in 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 other forms of of, of cattle. So yeah, we'll we'll definitely talk about that um a bit more. And Ed, w what is the significance of the tribal origin of of the the Nguni cows? Because in addition to this uh, natural selection, there was also a degree of of human selection by the tribal people. But it was obviously a very very specific um traits that the that the tribal people selected for. The cattle have always been the central part of all the indigenous tribes that came down. The, their whole life revolved around the cattle. And so there were certain traits, like, for example, color traits, like horn. Horns were important to some, but most important was the hardiness and the fact that they, these cattle could survive. So any cattle that could survive were really regarded as highly by them. Um, I don't know of any other breed anywhere in the world that has had to go through this form of natural selection. And, um, and this has always been overlooked. So, yes, in terms of the tribes, the connection is is uh, it is just inten intensely connected to the tribes. Um, not only the Zulus, but also the Avambos. Then you've get, you get the cattle in the Sudan, also 
their life revolves around their cattle. So cattle have always played an exceptionally important role in the life of the tribes. Yeah, and it's uh, it's a little bit difficult for us to conceive these days uh, how important these animals were to the existence of the community. And sure, you know, the, our relationship as modern uh, Westerners is that you know we we go to the supermarket and we go to the meat aisle and buy a uh, vacuum cryo vacked piece of of uh, meat. Um, I, I feel like for the majority of people, that's the extent to which the relationship they have between th- them and, and the animal. But to give some idea about the degree of, um, I guess, um, spiritual and connection that, that the Zulu and the other tribal people had to these animals is they they, they represented um, not only a food source, but also um, a milk source. Or it was their, their uh, form of value store, um, and it was obviously also related to to religion. So, uh, I think it's a it's a degree of um, connection that is difficult to fathom for the modern uh, m- modern Westerner. Yes, absolutely, Max. We we cannot really um, we can't really get behind the depth of that spiritual relationship. From, from our perspective. But the, the Zulu, for example, is an ancestor worshipper. And the cattle are the go-between between the people and the ancestors. And hence, they play a very important role um, in, for example, asking for rain, um, the and also it's a very paternalistic society. So the head of the crawl, the man, was the only one that was really allowed to go into the enclosure with the cattle because that's where the ancestors were resident. That's where the spirits were. So through the cows or through the cattle, he would talk to the spirits and receive guidance in that way. So in in much the same way as in Christian society, it, it, it is built around um, the belief in a God, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So now, in the Zulu society, it's around the ancestors and the cattle. The ancestors provide the channel, or, or the cows provide the channel to the ancestors. So... You can see that it's it's it plays a very important role in the culture. Yeah, and look, it, it reminds me of uh, Western A. Price's uh, section where he visits the Maasai tribes, and um, you know they have a, a similar relationship to their cattle, and they uh, are provided with this um, amazingly nourishing food. And when Western Price visited these people, he made note of how tall, how healthy, how glowing their skin was, how straight and white their teeth were. Uh, and these Maasai hunters, especially during the dry season, were subsisting on a combination of, of milk mixed with uh, blood, which they would draw from the uh, the jugular vein of their of their animals in a way that um, was didn't didn't harm them. Um, but but what that effectively did was uh, create such a symbiotic relationship in which the cow was supported and cared for, um, and the people were nourished. And I think that 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 relationship was borne out in the fact that these people were so healthy. And if you look at the average person or you look at someone suffering from obesity, from depression, uh, you know, quagmired in in modern health problems, that the disconnect from their food, I mean, they're eating in the products of industrial uh, agriculture that are sprayed with, you know, herbicides that have been, um, you know, the, the soil's been strip mined in an incredibly degenerative process. And it's almost like that that's manifested or born out in in the sickness of 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 the person because of the the food and the disconnect of the food that they they're consuming and and I think uh, factory factory farm meat definitely falls into that category uh, as well. So it, it, it's it's amazing to um, think about that that relationship and how special that was and how symbiotic. Um, uh, the, the the relationship was the uh, when I talked to farmer Edwin Rouse he he talk, told me about the there was a time where Westerners attempted to trade 
uh, Brahmin cattle that they'd brought in with the tribal people. Uh, and it lasted, I think, maybe one generation before that uh, that that deal was off. Can you can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. First of all, I want to get back to the symbiotic relationship that did exist between um, the people and their animals, or let's more specifically, the people and their cattle. Um, today's society, many young Kids think milk comes out of a bottle, and as you say, meat comes from the aisle in the supermarket. Um, not even giving a thought to what's behind the milk and the and the cow. That is to me a re relationship that we should try and get back to. And hence, I'm so adamant about re keeping keeping the uh, nguni pu pure. Um, but that's digressing from, from your question. Um, just repeat what you were saying. Um, I got sidetracked there. Uh, I, I was just making the comment that the the value of these creatures were such to the, the native people that they were offered these exotic breeds like Brahmin, um, but the, the, there was a reason okay. why that they, they would stick with Nguni up till that point because – of the traits of the animal and and when you yeah. introduced the brahmin into the, the the territory of the zulu people um it was pretty clear why um they were using a guni and not an, another cattle breed yes okay i'm with you max um so it's a complex situation because um originally the cattle breeders uh the zulu cattle breeders or the the African cattle breeders were very proud of their cattle. But then a number of things happened. Um, firstly, the um, British came along, and in the Zulu War, the British knew that they would never break the spirit of the Zulu people unless they broke, the, uh, the, unless they destroyed their animals which they subsequently did, and very few animals survived. Secondly, there was the rinder pest, which is a, a cattle sickness that virtually wiped out everything. And thirdly, um, the, when, when the British took over, they brought in their exotic breeds like Angus and Hereford and so on. And hence the, the gene pool was diluted because you start crossbreeding those exotic breeds with the Nguni, you lose that um, that wonderful tray that they had of, of, of being able to survive in advert condition. And so that was one thing. The other thing was that the nationalist government, when they took over, they decided these were just scrub cattle. They were worth nothing. They didn't really understand the value of these cattle. So they quite uh, they brought in cattle like Brahmin, bulls, and so on. And you find that it was further diluted. But because the Brahmin is a big animal. He was looked upon by these, by the owners as something valuable. And he was also kind of brainwashed into believing that his cattle were useless and that the European cattle were much better. That is totally false. And we've got to try and get back to the Zulu cattle breeder believing in his own original breed, which is by far the best. It's developed by nature, and we as human beings try as we like to try and work things out with science. Nature will still prevail eventually, and and I think that's that's what happened. I've just been back to um, the place where the Makatini um, ecotype came from. That's the book I wrote about the Makatini ecotype, and. It was quite sad to me to see 
the influence of the Brahmin cattle there on on the herds that are wandering around there. That the 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 bulls have become scrawny, big ears, really not good animals at all. And I, I read the other day in the newspaper that the government was donating Brahmin bulls to rural farmers. And I think that is incredibly short-sighted because it is only further diluting the whole uh, gene pool. So what I'm trying to do and what I'm so pleased, Edwin Rouse and Casey and people that you know in Australia are trying to do is to to preserve that gene pool, um, to keep it pure. But then it's it's also, there's the other side of the coin, is that a farmer needs to put bread on the table. What he is, he is guided by market values. If, if he's got an animal that sells and that is not pure, but it sells, that puts money on his table. But I think there is a fellow called Pat Hobbs here in South Africa who's farmed with Nguni for a long time. And if I remember correctly, in our conversation previously, you mentioned that he has found a way of crossbreeding and yet keeping the gene pool pure. Yes, um, and and let's talk. We'll talk about the conservation soon. Before before we do that, I I do want to finish um, guiding the listener through the attributes of the animal that make them so desirable. And okay. what, what what you said about the the Zulu. Um, were, were broken after the British were able to um, reduce or, or break their their uh, reliance on their cattle. It it really reminds me of the the eventual conquering of the American West, uh, and particularly the Comanche tribes by the Texans, and that only happened after they were able to uh, essentially destroy the herds of of, of bison. Uh, that that the Comanches and the other uh, Native American tribes were completely reliant on for nutrition, for clothing, um, as a means of trading and acquiring goods. So you, 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 we can see how deeply uh, ingrained human thriving uh, is on ruminant herbivores. And if we look at the stable isotope data, uh, there's a, one paper that I'm thinking of particularly, and it showed that around 50,000 years ago, uh, the mammoth was the pr- was one of the predominant protein sources and food sources for uh, for humans in in all across uh, Eastern Europe, and it, it really makes me think that the, the survive the the degree to which humans have thrived and survived uh, in history and ancestrally has been reliant on the consumption of ruminant herbivores and whether that is woolly mammoths 50 years ago whether that's bison on the american west or whether that's cattle um with the with the african and zulu tribes it it seems like we are we are deeply reliant on um this type of of on ruminant herbivores for our nutrition and and it really thinks about what's happening in this day and age where red meat is being demonized red meat is um in my opinion, being unfairly and incorrectly uh, pro- targeted as and um, persecuted as a source of uh, causing human disease, which in which I don't believe is uh, correct at all. And you know, if we draw the analogy back to the Maasai and the Comanches, it's like, well, hang on, maybe we're in in the same way being being attacked and deprived of our um, of our strength if if we're unable to have access to to high quality ruminant and animal meat and the the point though that i really wanted to home home in for the for the listeners is that this is an animal the nguni animal is uh, as we mentioned so highly adapted that it has been able to survive in regions that um other cattle aren't able to and so 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 what what some of the characteristics that maybe Ed you can talk to as well um, are hardiness, but also fertility. So, so maybe give us an idea about the fertility of these animals um, compared to other cattle breeds. There's extensive research being done on fertility in comparison to other cattle breeds, and it by far surpasses any other breed that I know of. Uh, in terms of fertility, 
Um, so what the animals are compared to always is in terms of weight. The animal has a smaller carcass, the nguni animal has a smaller carcass, and therefore weighs less. However, you are able to breed five more, I might be wrong with these figures, but a lot more per hectare than you are um, with other breeds. What's happened is, yes, the Brahmins are quite hardy. They come in, but what you gain in weight there is you lose in fertility. So you're actually losing in the end because um, they're not as fertile. They, they, they are really not as fertile as, as the Nguni. But be that as it may, that's not the only part. Um, you talk about the bison and, and the, in, in Kenya and Tanzania, the big, um, the big movement of wildebeest and zebra and, um, and so on, the migrations, as they call them, uh, which was, were so good because the animals moved from one part of uh, the country to another, depending where the rain has fallen, thereby with their hooves, um, turning over the soil with their urine and their, their um, droppings, fertilizing the soil again. And so it was a continuous process. That was broken. And what happens is that there's a lot of soil that needs regenerating. Um, all over the world, um, we find you put an exotic animal into the into that area, and it'll the only eye. animal, I believe, and I might be wrong, that survives will be the Nguni cattle. And so it plays right into the hands of those people who want to try and regenerate um, the soil, having large numbers of cattle. Now, there's a guy called um, Alan Savory who's done a, quite a few videos on this, May well be interesting for people to have uh, to Google him, Alan Savory, called uh, desertification. Uh, it's a very good video that one can look at. Um, but in any event, I don't know of any other breed of cattle that will survive climate change as well as the Nguni cattle will. And hence, the start of this um, group. A WhatsApp group that we've called that you you have actually started called Nguni International, where one wants to look at um, Nguni, for example, in the South Americas, in Brazil, other countries, especially in Australia. So I see a great future simply because of the ability of these animals to adapt. Yeah, and thank you, Ed, for bringing that that point up because that is the second part of why I think the these cattle are so uh, amazing. Uh, so the first, as we talked about, was their hardiness, their ability to thrive in marginal conditions, their ability to survive tick-borne um, attack without needing drenches or any form of human uh, chemical, their ability to uh, a calf easily and never having to need to pull a calf, their ability to have a calf, you know, for 16 years in a row in some cases. Uh, so these are all the, the traits that are inherent in, in the animal uh, that make them amazing uh, food and uh, and human food, and they taste great as well. But what your point you bring up is that, that they're an, also an amazing tool for land regeneration. And I want to make the point that the real environmentalism isn't uh, get, importing a whole bunch of uh, industrial solar panels from China and turning your prime agricultural land into uh, a massive field of, of, of black silicon chips. Uh, that, that in my mind, that isn't uh, in environmentalism. The real environmentalism is, is rebuilding the soil, uh, content, the soil moisture, the topsoil layer, using ruminant herbivores as tools of land regeneration. And we've talked about the the bison herds and their accounts in the late 1800s of, of uh, people of Europeans coming to 
the Middle West, Midwest of the US. And the topsoil was something like, uh, you know, six meters deep uh, because it had the thousand years, thousands of years of uh, ruminant herbivores essentially grazing it completely, trampling it, as you mentioned, dropping all their feces and then moving on. And that process of intensive grazing followed by rest was what was able to to build such fertility in, into the soil. So what what Ed is what Ed you're suggesting and what I'm agreeing you with is that if we can use an animal that is in, incredibly robust and incredibly able to survive drought and, and marginal conditions and still have a calf every year, then we can use those animals to regenerate and reverse desertification, not only in Africa, but also in places like, like Australia. And in, in Australia, we have a massive amount of land that would be amenable to uh, regeneration using rumen, uh, uh, animals like like uh, the like cattle. And I think, you know, Nguni are, are the perfect uh, animal for the job. So I guess... Uh, tying both those together is that what we have and what we Ed, you and I've talked about previously is that we have an amazing resource. This is a genetic endowment that nature has provided to humanity in the form of these pure, pure blooded and goony cattle. And the really, I see it as a technology. It's almost like we've got an incredibly advanced technology for land regeneration, for human food consumption, um, in the form of this this animal that has been a product of intense natural and uh, and favorable human selection. So uh, that's, I guess, a good segue, uh, Ed, into the conservation aspect of of Nguni, because as I see it and as you see it, it is our duty and our um, our job to preserve the genetic lineage of this this creature and, and and not let it get diluted so that we can preserve its it these animals to use for us now but also for for future generations hmm. yes um indeed we are the custodians of of these animals i mean as you say it's it's an endowment to us it would be terribly remiss of us if we just let it go. It's it's our duty to to see to it that this animal survives. And I was very encouraged, having recently attended the annual general meeting of the South African Nguni Society, where the top breeders came together, and I was amazed at the positive vibe that existed there, and um, the was encouraged that while some of the ecotypes might be in danger of extinction, I don't think that the Nguni um, as as a breed is likely to get extinct. If we can continue to convince governments and Nguni breeders about the value of of our heritage. We have to do that. We've got to try and convince them of the value of our heritage, and that involves marketing. It involves all sorts of things. Um, precisely what we're doing now with your podcast is one of those tools that we can use um, to try and promote the breeze. It, I'm really so pleased that Edwin Rice and others have been able to um, start with a pure gene pool in Australia. Um, and there are many committed people there that are wanting to um, to continue this at their own great expense. But they're so passionate about it that I am sure they will do it. And, and that's good to know. Um, I've also recently at the AGM um, met people who know of, of farmers in America that are breeding Nguni cattle under a different name. So one needs to investigate that as well. So, yes, um, Nguni International has a job to do in trying to, trying to find out where are the other sources of pure genes and how can we continue that. But at the same time, 
it needs to be said that there's always two sides to a story. And one has to try and balance the, well, probably the emotional side that I'm talking about uh, and the practical side, uh, the financial side that is also, uh, you can't just ignore that. We have to find the right balance between the two, I think. And I think we're getting there slowly. Yes, and and let's talk a little bit about what you mentioned earlier in the podcast, which is uh, these contrasting interests. And what what we mean by that is that the commodity meat market has a certain set of requirements in terms of cattle, cattle size, carcasses, cattle shape, cattle color. And the commodity market is basically favoring uh, the uh, British breeds like Angus, and they're, they're but it's more than that. They're favoring uh, breeders and producers to raise cows as quickly as possible and get them to that weight, um, carcass weight, as quickly as possible. And what this is doing is essentially setting up a perverse incentive set that breeders aren't necessarily incentivized to steward the genome of steward the genetics of something like the Nguni for for posterity. They're instead uh, incentivized to simply gas their land and their animals and squeeze them as quickly as possible uh, to make as much money in the short term as possible. And I talked to Texas Slim uh, earlier in in the podcast series about why that that necessarily is the case uh, for the fact that there's a been a bunch of economic changes, especially in the past 50 years, that have really um, altered the landscape in terms of um, incentives and uh, economic incentives about w- w- what is profitable from a farming point of view. But uh, as you say, Ed, there's a, there should be a bunch of different ways of working around this and and essentially uh, breeding the Nguni with another bull to get a, 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 a offspring that you then sell to the commodity market but don't breed again from that's that's yeah. that's one option but yes like we have to be realistic in in terms of balancing our point of view which is one of conservation um with the the practic- practicalities and the, the realities of of farmers who have obviously to have, have an economic imperative um in in, in their in, in their yeah. operations the other point that you you alluded to is this idea of fostering the growth of inguni beyond eastern africa uh, and Southern Africa, where it's it's come from, and I, again, I'd encourage listeners to go back to my earlier episode with Edwin Rouse, who is an, a South African expat now living in Australia, and he, along with other breeders, have brought Nguni embryos. They flushed their animals, um, and and they harvested embryos uh, in Africa, and then brought them frozen to Australia and then implanted them in surrogates uh, and have since repopulated a full blood, pure blood in Guni herd uh, using em- embryo transfer, which is amazing and fantastic uh, use of modern, modern technology. And um, what that has allowed us to do is essentially have a small herd of full blooded in Guni Mac- from the Makatini area, which is um, what, what Ed has talked about and where that area that the most harsh area that these animals evolved in. Um, and then, Simply using them back in in Australia and, and using them to, to to breed out. So there is at the moment the biosecurity rules preclude us from importing any more embryos, and that's an Australian government uh, rule currently. But mm. Ed, I mean, I'm sure in other other countries or this other ways where we can people who are interested could potentially set up uh, uh, an Nguni in their national area and anywhere that's tick infested anywhere that has marginal country is all going to be benefiting from from a goonie these animals can survive in the desert there's there's photos recently posted by one of the breeders of in the high veld in africa in south africa they were walking around in snow so like like i've talked to jake wolke this is an apocalypse cow this can survive in in incredible technology it can survive in any um conditions so hopefully um more people internationally can get involved and recreate or um, take some Nguni genetics and recreate a full-blooded population in in their area. One thing we haven't mentioned, Max, is the fact that the Nguni is also a browser. And that's very important in difficult times when grazing is sparse. They also browse and they they do very well on that. Uh, I've seen a couple of videos where a breeder has has proved that his animals are looking good 
simply because they are also able to browse. But yes, you're talking about um, Australia and what is being done there. I think we've only just scratched the surface of this. Um, the, to my knowledge, this breed lacks public, um, what do you call it, public, lacks awareness of the public. We need to make public aware of the strengths of these animals. And, um, and that requires marketing. It requires all sorts of things. But I think we're starting to get there. Um, I'm certainly finding um, with this book that I've written um, that people are becoming interested. They're becoming interested in, well, what's behind this? They always ask me, what's the history of these animals? Where they come from? And so, um, so I think we're getting somewhere in terms of getting more exposure for the animals and thereby also um, making people think about them. That's the big thing. Um, yes, it's not such an easy situation. It's a complex thing. But I think there's enough passionate people around to, to make it work. Yeah, and and look, I, I I think there's many ways that we can help promote the uptake of Omanguni and, and Ed. I'll get your your thoughts as well, but uh, I, I think there's a future in promoting small scale regenerative farming that sells their meat directly to the consumer, um, similar to what uh, my friend Jake Walkie is doing in 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 Albury, uh, where you can you can visit the farm, you can vet its practices, you can see that he's not using any form of of chemical vaccine or any anything else, and and that is something that people are concerned about uh, more and more in this day and age, uh, in terms of ever complex um, and untested uh, human forms of interventionism uh, in in cattle. And I think the key thing about Nguni is their resilience uh, obviates the need for any type of uh, you know mRNA technology or anything else because it's simply so robust that there's there's literally no reason to need to to vaccinate uh or, or anything else um the herd if it's if it's grazed regeneratively so again i think that's another big selling point for people in the future who are concerned about um their food provenance is we'll we'll get a find a local farmer that that is using that is raising fully grass-fed cattle um it might be in guni it might be another one but it, that, that process of of vetting and of reducing the steps between you and your food is going to be um, key in in terms of of uh, moving forward the the other thing that I guess it'd be a great or do you have any other suggestions and and, and look before sorry before I I, I uh, invite you to give your answer the other aspect of it is allowing bigger breeders to to use Nguni um, and, and and commercial breeders have their own incentives as we talked about but as if they can still preserve the breed um, at the same time as making money in the commodity market in the ways that we talked about through maybe rem um, keeping a core of Nguni pure full blood and then breeding terminal size for for the commodity market then that's that's one option but Ed, any any other kind of suggestions for raising the profile I think it's I was very encouraged as I, as I said with the South African and Guni societies steps that they're taking to include the commercial farmer in this whole process rather than exclude him um, it's a matter of trying to include him and the problem I see at the moment lies with the abattoir now a butcher has to get his meat from the abattoir. It's law. It's law. He has to get it. And there's reasons for that. However, one needs to try and convince the abattoir that he, he should be taking smaller carcasses rather than just weight. Anyway, I'm not a farmer. I'm, I'm really just a photographer. Um, but I've been, I've been getting involved in this question. And I think that steps are being taken uh, by the South African and Guni Society and the president of the society has expressed a wish to actually stay in contact with 
the Australian counterpart and share ideas, which is very encouraging. So I think you are probably in Australia further down the road in terms of being able to supply um, guni meat or whatever kind of meat straight from the farm to the consumer, whereas we are still shackled here by a lot of legislation that doesn't allow that. But, mm. but I think you're right. That is the future, the way things will go. <laughs> it's quite yeah. funny. I, uh, down in Zululand where I have just been, there's no regulation there. People really do what they like. You, you, find, you find a carcass hanging from the side of a tree on the side of the road and people taking meat off there. There's no, there's no government legislation and nobody does anything about it. It's happening. But I think more and more we're going to be less formal in the way that um, we try and um, produce, produce food. That's my opinion. Anyway. Yeah. No, and, and look, who, who knows if, uh, you know, some people are quite worried about uh, various impositions in terms of the re required regulations regarding uh, vaccinations of cattle. So who knows, you might see uh, something similar happen in Australia if those rules come in. People will uh, have their carcass hanging in the, in, on the <laughs> gum tree and cut off the, their ribeye when they're hungry. But, uh, Ed, look, t talk a little bit um, – Talk, talk to us a little bit about how you got involved in Nguni because, as you mentioned, you're a photographer. You've written a ma an amazing picture book called The Nguni of the Makatini Flats, and I'll include that information in the show notes. But talk to us a little bit about how you got involved in Nguni and uh, what. talk to us about the book that you've written. Okay, so I won't give you the long story because we'll spend another hour talking here, but the, the shorter version is that my great-grandfather – came to South Africa as a Lutheran missionary. He was posted in Zululand um, near King Tetuayo's crawl. Now, King Tetuayo was the Zulu king at the time. And um, because my great-grandfather was in the Hanoverian army before he became a missionary, Tetuayo was very interested in his military knowledge. So... He summoned the missionary uh, and said, look, what can you tell me about, you know, about your military knowledge? And as a reward, rewarded him with some Nguni cattle. And so my great-grandfather was involved. Um, my grandfather was not involved. He was just, he was a missionary, but he translated the Bible into Zulu. My father again, went back to his grandfather and was very involved. He was always very interested in Zulu culture. And, of course, as I've said before, Zulu culture revolves around their cattle. So when he retired, he became the curator of a Fort Durnford Museum and Escort where he built a genuine Zulu crawl according to exact specifications with the, the pure cattle and everything else that goes with it. He then drew up a register of color patterns. Uh, when he went down to Zululand, talked to all the herders and said, what is this color pattern called in Zulu? They would tell him, and he drew up a register of color patterns with the English and Zulu names. For example, a cow that is white with black spots on it would be called Amasi Nempugane. Now, if you want to translate that into English, it is flies in the buttermilk. Absolutely perfect name for a cow. They were all spot on. Or, for example, a cow had these lyre-shaped horns like this. So they called them Pafazi Bapikikela. That in English means the woman repudiate the case. They say, oh, no, 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 that sort of thing. So he drew up a color pattern. And I introduced him to a friend of mine called Marguerite Poland, who's a fairly well-known author in this country. And he convinced her to do a doctorate on the book. 
uh, on the color patterns. And so she used his research for that doctorate and then wrote a book called The Abundant Herds. Um, I think there is a copy either with Edwin or with you. Um, and then that book and my dad actually started, I believe, the regeneration of the Nguni and made it popular, if only for the color patterns. Um, so I was never interested. And when I retired, my wife gave me a little point and shoot camera and said, go and, go and play. I don't need you under my feet. Uh, I started playing, but that playing became um, a passion. I started photographing Nguni cattle on the estate where I live, and I haven't looked back since. And since then, I've, I've, I, I've still photographed cattle, and I actually got to meeting a WhatsApp group called the the Makatini WhatsApp group. This was a group of guys who went down and bought the cattle, the original cattle. And I listened to their stories and I thought, this is good, too good to lose. And I, I photographed the cattle, I told them stories and eventually turned into a book. And that's where I am today. That book has been a great success. And um, I am now photographing cattle again. So that, that's where I am today. I am retired and I don't know why I haven't done this from when I first started work. <laughs> but uh, yes, so that, that's my passion and that's what I'm, I'm doing at the moment. Great, Ed, and and you mentioned to me before that you know you're you're seventy six, almost about to turn seventy seven, and this has been your life, your work that you're dedicating yourself to for the for the for this part of your life. So it's it's very admirable, and um, it's an amazing book and work that you've created. So uh, I will definitely give the uh, people an idea about where they can buy a copy of the book, um, and we'll also uh, give them. Uh, and give them maybe some idea about how they can connect with you. Uh, and obviously, if they want to learn more, if they want interested in running in Goonie, uh, maybe just send me a message and I can connect them with some breeders in Australia or um, in Africa. Um, I'm sure we can connect people if they're interested. Um, but yeah, please let us know where people can find you, talk to you, email you, or contact you otherwise. Um, that is very kind of you. I would I would really enjoy that because um, – this is what I enjoy doing is putting people together that are passionate about Nguni. Um, if they want to know about farming the Nguni, Edwin Rouse would be the guy in, in Australia. If they want me to put them in contact with people in South Africa, I'm, I'm in a position to do that. So, yes, um, Max, that's very kind of you to offer that. And um, I look forward to... To carrying on with us for the next tomorrow i turn 77 so i look forward to another uh, or oh, many more years if i'm blessed with those just doing what i'm doing right now okay ed well thank you so much for your time and uh, have a great day thanks thanks max it's been a pleasure See ya. all right okay what did you think of that interview I'm blown away by Ed's dedication and passion to the cause of preserving and educating about the Nguni cattle. I didn't mention to Ed in the interview, but I really like the idea of setting up, perhaps in Australia or, or in another country, a, a wild herd of Nguni that would be simply um, only exposed to natural selection that we could use as a, a repository of genetics one that is free from human interventionism and and human uh perception of what is useful or valuable in a cow and again give that give that job back to mother nature and simply let the most fit for survival animal um and, and herd kind of uh persist and i think northern australia or northern territory would be uh, amazing for that um for that job it would be like a, a jurassic park type uh uh, repository or, or store of genetic information and one which uh, we could draw from collectively 
um, in into the future. So if you're, I uh, hope you, you enjoyed the podcast. And again, please share with me any thoughts. If you're interested perhaps in running in Guni or you want to be put in touch with some of the breeders, then let me know and I can or contact me and I can uh, make that those connections. Uh, again, please share the podcast, subscribe and uh, share with everyone else. Thank you very much.